happy 150th anniversary to Mines. Uh, we did celebrate Founders Day on February 9th here on campus and had a ribbon cutting for one of our newest buildings, uh, Labriola Innovation Hub. And and uh, it just is a kind of an amazing opportunity to, you know, both look back at 150 years uh, you know, from our founding and and just where what's going on right now with uh, new buildings, new opportunities. And I think it just springboard us in some great, great, uh, I don't think new ideas and inventions that'll come out of our students at mine. So um, very exciting. If you are in town, um, please do stop by and check out the, the new space at Labriola. It's beautiful. Uh, but welcome to our February lunch month. Uh, I'm Andy Flynn, Director of Alumni Engagement at Mines, and I'm delighted to see uh, so many of you today. It's uh, This is our first, if this is your first lunch bunch, welcome. And if you're a regular attendee, we thank you for your continued interest and support. We always enjoy seeing familiar faces uh, on the screen each month. Uh, well, if you've been uh, living under a rock or maybe just licking one, uh, you know this <laughs> month, marks the official founding of Mines in 1874. We've come a long way over the last 150 years. And today we'll look back at Mines' early days, its founding figures and faculty, and share a few quirky fun facts that'll impress all of your non-Mines friends. We are all proud to be part of the unique traditions that have set Mines apart from any other school in the country. And hope to have time at the end of today's program for some of you to share your stories and memories. So join us as we take a short walk. We are time limited uh, down memory lane as we continue our monthly look at the people and programs that make Minds great. Today, we are pleased to welcome Lisa Dunn, Interim Director of the Arthur Lakes Library and Manager of Minds Archives and Special Collections, who will share a brief history of Minds. Before we start, a few quick reminders. If you think of a question during the program, please feel free to use the chat. We'll keep an eye on that. And if we run out of time and don't get to your question, we'll <laughs> circle back with you after the program. All of our Lunch Bunch programs are recorded and can be accessed on the Lunch Bunch page of the alumni website at weare.minds.edu. So if you missed one, want to listen again, or like to share the program with a friend, visit the page to access the complete archive of recordings going back to 2021 when we started Lunch Punch in a virtual format. We built up quite a library there, so uh, a lot of uh, great presenters and good conversations, so please uh, take advantage of that. As always, if you have ideas for future speakers or topics, we want to know about them. Please contact me, Ruth, or anyone in the alumni office <laughs> with your suggestions, and we'll do our best to make it happen. All right, let's get things started. Grab your slide rules and Stetsons, and let's welcome Lisa Dunn to our February Lunch Bunch. Lisa, take it Hi. away. Um, so I'm going to share my screen, and Ruth is going to let me know if there's any technical difficulties. <laughs> um, is that good? Okay. So this is my intro screen on, um, did you know uh, things about Mines history? Um, my talks are almost always very informal. So please use the chat and Ruth will interrupt me as she feels appropriate for pretty much anything. Um, so, sorry. So we're gonna do a, a little bit about the Mines history archive and preserving our past and, and telling your story if you have how you're connected with Mines. We're gonna do a quick and bouncy tour of early campus and intersperse that with some fun facts and some trivia. Um, and if we get to the end of my slide deck, uh, there's uh, so, some places to learn more and uh, Q&A is, is throughout this the talk because this is very informal. I'm gonna apologize in advance. I've got a little bit of a scratchy throat. So you maybe see me um, drinking some iced tea or something. Um, so, uh, Mines History Archive. It was established in 2015. There had been a couple other attempts at archives and the, that materials kind of disappeared or ended up in closets or something. And the, the purpose of the, the Mines History Archive is to tell the story of mines. It's one of four special collections we have at the library. Uh, I keep I keep it in my, my, okay. So we collect on a, a variety of subjects, pretty much anything to do with mines. 
This includes the campus, uh, university business, education and research, all aspects of student life, uh, alumni stories, um, whether they were from their time at Mines or afterwards in their careers, and town and gown. And so this is a picture of some, some um, Mines students, and this is the Mines Band marching down Washington Avenue. Uh, and some of the buildings, the buildings are still there. They just have a different different uh, shape now. So Mines at 150, that's uh, where we're kind of making a push to make sure people can learn as much as they want about the history of Mines. We have a digital archives in the Mines repository. Uh, the Ore Digger student newspaper is available from Colorado Historic Newspapers collection up through, I think, spring of 2012. Uh, the library is going to be doing some history displays. Uh, our first one should come up, I think, next week. And uh, we are also doing talks and presentations. Anybody who wants to have a presentation or talk with their group, please contact me. I'm happy to talk on various aspects of the School of Mines. Uh, this is the, by the way, uh, the centennial scrapbook that was created for the 1974 100th anniversary um, on, on all of the, the things that they did and, and the, the, the advertisements they made and things like that. And this is kind of one of those ever-present pushball games um, that mine students used um, uh, kind of as a, initially as a, as a, as a safer way of, of, a, of celebrating. Um, and it, uh, homecomings and E-Days often had a, a pushball. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about telling your story because this is your story. Anybody who's connected with Mines, it's Mines story is your story. So uh, Mines History Archive is about 90 plus percent donated materials from uh, alumni or anyone who was involved with Mines. Um, so if you have things that you are interested in donating, please contact me. Um, it's, it's never a bad thing to record your experiences. Uh, people's experiences varied so widely over time and, and from person to person. Uh, we've had people give us write-ups of their, their academic career, their class, um, social life organizations, uh, what they did in athletics and, and how they worked with traditions and things like that. Um, so here we've got a couple of um, E-Days programs. Uh, quite the contrast. I mean, the top one is 69 and the the, the bottom one is is a, a different 69. Um, the upper right is a junior and senior prom uh, dance card. And you can't really read the, the caption very well, but it the caption is out in, out in the cold world. That was referring to the seniors being you know, kicked out. And finally, one of those marches to the Capitol. Okay. Um, and and by the way, it's a any anything you can do to spread the word about Mines history or the Mines history archive, so that we can gather more pieces of the mine story. Uh, I'm happy to happy to see those. Um, so I'm going to do this quick kind of bouncy tour of early Colorado School of Mines. I'm skipping a lot of things because we don't have uh, 48 hours. Um, so uh, and this the thing many people probably have seen before. Um, this is the Jarvis Hall Collegiate School. This is our precursor. Um, uh, an Episcopal bishop um, uh, created Jarvis Hall Collegiate School off where the the down old Golden Road where the Lookout Mountain School for Boys is on the hills there. So basically out in the country uh, for the early uh, Golden. Uh, in the, the center left is the actually Jarvis Hall. That was the academic center. To the right is the brand new School of Mines building. And uh, screen left, if it wasn't built at that point, was Matthews Hall, the Divinity School. And Bishop Randall, the, the, the bishop who founded the school, wanted to put together this comprehensive um, higher education institution. And it just so happened that the School of Mines had been a, a topic of a conversation for quite some time and, and a very contentious topic of conversation. Now, where do we put a school of mines? Colorado wanted one. Where to put it was a whole different story. There's there's reams and reams of acrimonious newspaper articles and editorials about this, which I won't get into, but uh, Golden got it because we had someone who was creating a university here. And so school of mines fit right in. So um, uh, the school of mines opened in 1873 before the, the building was finished. We became the Territorial School of Mines in 1874. That's the year we celebrate our anniversaries, is, is, uh, which is this year, and a State School of Mines in 1876. 
So our first fun fact is, has anybody heard of the Denver School of Mines? Sounds like a big no, because I didn't hear of it for uh, quite a while. Um, the Denver School of Mines was established by E.J. Mallet in 1875. Uh, Mallet was the professor in charge of our school of mines and left our school to establish a rival school in Denver. Uh, he was lured away, um, that's what I have to think of it anyway, as uh, by the mayor of, of Denver and leading prominent politicians and businessmen who wanted to, who felt that the school of mines should have been in Denver. So they started a school of mines downtown Denver on 15th and Curtis. Uh, kind of in the basement. And and so um, the first class of the Denver School of Mines was mostly Mallet's backers, uh, the politicians and the people who were donating some money and things like that. It didn't last very long. Uh, they did put on an advertisement to, to come to the Denver School of Mines, which was kind of met with some sarcasm and cynicism by other newspapers. Um, and it folded pretty quickly, it just kind of disappeared. So that's just uh, one of those fun facts that I, I haven't ever heard anybody say anything about. So. Um, in 1878, we moved from uh, south of Golden to downtown Golden, relocated our classrooms and our labs in, in the town of Golden. Uh, 1880, we were established on today's campus. Uh, that is the first building on campus, the building of 1880. It had another name, but I, I needed to put dates on them to keep them straight. So this is the building of 1880. It's the first one. Um, and it was a very imposing building built, built up on the hills above Golden, which is where we are now. So, trivia, why did the school move? Let me chime in here and tell you how this is going to roll, everybody, okay? Uh, this is the first of uh, several trivia questions that will appear on your screen as Lisa gives her presentation. Um, as they come up, uh, Lisa will read the question, and for, for those who get it right, who are the first to get it right and type it in the chat, we have some little goodies for you that we're going to mail to you for a little prize. So got to be, you know, quick to the keyboard. First person to put the answer, the correct answer in the chat will win. So let's just take a quick second here. Uh, any guesses? If you have a guess, put it in the chat. Here we go, starting now. <laughs> Flooding, no, good guess. Uh, apparently, yes, they did want more space, Stephanie. <laughs> um, and Lisa can talk about that. Any other guesses? And if no one guesses it, I'll give it to the person who's closest. How about that? That'll be fair. Anybody else have a, a guess as to why the school moved? Flooding isn't bad. It's you know wrong, what? it's not bad. I think we'll just give it to Stu. Good job, Stu. The actual answer is... Oops, sorry. Um, too many things on my keyboard. Yeah. Ah, fires. Okay, so fire, flood, natural disaster. It's all in the same vein. Congrats to Stu. <laughs> I got some goodies coming your way, friend. All right. <laughs> So that's so, how we'll do these as we go forward. It's the first one to put it in the chat correctly, and I'll be watching that. So, Or has the best crazy oh. answer would work too, maybe. <laughs> that's true. So, okay. so basically, basically what happened is uh, Jarvis Hall Collegiate School, the main hall burned down. Um, and very shortly and suspiciously thereafter, apparently, uh, Matthews Hall, the Divinity School, burned down, leaving just the School of Mines building. Uh, these buildings were never meant to be standalone buildings. A lot of the, the classroom and, and lab work took place in one of the other buildings. So the School of Mines wasn't really viable with, with its last sad building um, in Jarvis Hall Collegiate School. Um, and there was a lot of contra there, there was a lot of suspicion, especially among Golden citizens, that that arson was involved to keep Golden from having a school of mines. They were just, you know, and 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 this went on for a while, but no one, it it seemed like they really did just have uh did they just burn down? Okay. Um, so now we jump a little ahead. Uh, this is the same campus. And by 1890, uh, School of Mines had grown sufficiently. Although the classes, the cl the actual enrolled classes were very, very small. The people who showed up for a few classes um, were, were growing. 
And so this is the buildings of 1880 starting left and then left to right, 1880, 82, and 1890. Um, the building 1890, you can tell my, my Photoshopping in, into that is, is not fantastic. Um, and that building is actually the, the size of both of the other buildings put together. Um, so it had, a, it had a nice big row of academic buildings on campus. Um, and, and it was growing and it was successful. So here's a picture of the, uh, or sorry, a map of campus in 1895. Uh, we had the main hall, which is what they, they decided to call it at the time. That, that name changed off and on, depending on who was writing about it. Um, so main hall in the center, um, and that's the uh, bottom to top. It's, it's building 1880, 82, and 1890. Engineering hall was built in 1894, and that's on the right-hand side. Athletics field was was actually established by this time uh, down by Clear Creek by the clay pits. Um, although there were other uh, open fields, I mean, this is still an open field sort of a place. And so they had practice in, in various other athletic events out in the fields near near the campus. And the president's house is on the left. So just to orient you, I guess I should have done that first. The top of the map, and this, by the way, was drafted by mine students. The top of the map is um, 14th Street today. Okay, so this is oriented north at the top. It was 4th Street, 4th Street at the time. The bottom of the map is where 5th, 15th Street would be. It was 5th Street then. Now it is the um, straight shot looking from Guggenheim Hall straight east to the, the Table Mountains, and it's our campus quad. Okay, so that's that's what we've got here. Um, let's see. I got too many devices on my... Okay, next trivia. Who was the first woman graduate of the School of Mines? Okay, first one to type it in the chat. Go. Hey. Anybody have a guess? I know some of you know this, but Mona, <laughs> I'm calling you out. Ooh, call out. Ugh. Damn. Here we go. There's a, a guess in the chat. Ah, Steve James. Boom, ba boom. Ah, uh, Patty. Sorry, I think Steve beat you to the punch. Florence Caldwell, indeed, was our first graduate. And Lisa, correct me if I'm wrong. I think she graduated 1898. 1898. Yeah. She okay, was... Kelsey, let me just interject for your oh, yeah, 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 correct yeah. answer. Yeah. You will receive a really awesome car decal and a pewter keychain. Congrats to Steve. Okay, continue. Okay, so just a little bit more about Florence. Um, she was a non-traditional student. She'd already gotten a degree elsewhere. Um, or if I remember it, she'd gotten a degree elsewhere. Uh, came here, um, uh, still not quite sure why, um, and uh, she was actually a math prodigy um, and, and, and ac actually received um, uh, advanced tutoring because she was outpacing the other students. Um, so she got her degree, it was a civil engineering degree. It was the first civil engine engineering degree ever offered at Mines. Mines was experimenting with degrees and so degrees were dropping in and off the catalog at a pace I just can't even describe. Uh, so we didn't have another civil engineering degree for, for like 100 years, more than 100 years. Uh, no, not quite that. So maybe 70 years, something like that. So, so um, and she actually went off uh, and, and, and went, uh, went off to marry uh, somebody who was a student who was also working or going to mines. And um, uh, the understanding is that, that she, with all her engineering skills, actually acted as a partner for her husband in his various mining efforts. Um, so, so now we get into more of a, a bigger campus. By 1910, there'd been what, quite a bit of expansion. Main hall, that three building hall was there. The assay lab was built, the powerhouse, the assay lab is the, 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 uh, building to the left with the, the stacks, uh, on the right of it would have been where the powerhouse was going to be built. This is an early photo Stratton hall shown here. Engineering hall, Guggenheim hall, the gymnasium, which was north of Guggenheim hall. And the M, all by 1910. So trivia, when was the M constructed? 
Ready, set, go. Wow, Kip, holy smokes. Fast fingers you are, indeed. 1908, correct, Lisa? It is correct, but I, I didn't put 1908 because that's boring. Um, but <laughs> so this is the first time I've actually seen the M depicted uh, in, in any school publication. This was the first prospector yearbook. And, and the top of every page, uh, there's probably a technical term for that in publication land. Uh, the top of every page had a panoramic view of Mount Zion and the M uh, to celebrate the fact that they had one. Okay. So I want to talk a little bit about that, the assay lab and the mostly the assay lab, a little bit about the powerhouse. Um, the, this is the interior of the assay lab. That was the building with the smokes, with the stacks. Um, these were assay stations. Mostly seniors worked in the assay lab, but there was a, a desk with a, a, a faculty member overseeing things. Um, and so this is the environment they worked in. Uh, the, the assay lab later became, well, actually, when they built the power plant, uh, the powerhouse, they they connected the two with a kind of an arch initially. Okay, so that's that's now it's all one building. Uh, by 1936, it was Mining Engineering Hall. I think that was the first time Mining Engineering had its own building. Uh, by 1951, it was Chauvenet Hall, named after President Regis Chauvenet. So fun fact, the assay house, upperclassmen only. Freshmen entered it at their peril. And I mean that like seriously. Um, uh, trespassers, which was mostly the underclassmen, were punished um, if they could catch them. And they often did. They apparently couldn't run fast enough. Um, uh, a trespassing underclassman would be uh, scrubbed around with coal dust. And then if there was time between classes, hauled over to the gymnasium across the street and dumped in the pool. <laughs> so, uh, and also if, if you went between the, if you went between the buildings, that was off limits. Uh, some of the sidewalks on campus were off limits. The lawn was off limits. Um, so sometimes the freshmen had to run to class because they otherwise they wouldn't make it to the particular building. They could only go in certain doors like Stratton Hall. They couldn't go in the main door. They had to go in a side door. Um, and and uh, so it was it was interesting to be a freshman at the time. Um, and so that's that's it, it just kind of how it was. Um, so oops, uh, a little bit about, let's make sure I got this, a little bit about Guggenheim Hall, uh, built in 1906. It was designed to be the center of campus, which it still is iconically. You, it's looking down, this was then 15th Street, 5th Street, I think, which was a dirt road at the time. Uh, it actually had the largest private donation to a college in Colorado from, from the Guggenheim family um, and, and uh, uh, Guggenheim Sr., I, I want to talk a little about the old gymnasium because Guggenheim's, I didn't put a picture of Guggenheim on here because I think we've seen it. We have not seen the old gymnasium. Uh, it was built in 1908 and it was built kind of where the library is now. Um, this building was a showpiece. I, th I think it was designed by the, the, the current president at the time, who I think was President Alderson. It had the, what well, was reported that the first official basketball court in the area. Prior to that, people used barns or empty warehouses uh, sometimes. Um, it had reportedly the first swimming pool in the region. And it had something that that is, is kind of like psychologically jarring. It had a club room. When you think about it, the, the early campus, it was all academic buildings or athletic buildings. There was no other place to hang out. Students had no place to go in between classes or after class, except to back to their rooms in Golden typically or Denver. So they had this very nice club room built, uh, I think on the ground floor of, of the old gymnasium. It was fancy, it had pool tables. I think it had a piano in there somewhere. It had uh, tables where you could play cards. Um, uh, you know, And this was, this was where the first time the students actually had their own space to hang out in. So, and I couldn't go without uh, talking about the athletic field. Um, uh, the athletic field was established uh, uh, very early on uh, down by Clear Creek. Um, over time in the early 1900s, it was referred to as the mine's rock pile. And the reason for that is because it literally was full of rocks. Um, and, and people complained about the injuries they got or bragged about them, I guess, uh, depending on who they were, who they were having football games with. Um, an entire campus of People who did surveying all knew that the southwest corner was 10 feet higher than the northeast corner. 
and there was no place to sit for 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 people who were you know for spectators. So people from Golden and campus brought their own chairs. Uh, a lot of times they they brought excess or old broken furniture and left it there. So there was always a collection of furniture around the field so you could sit. Um, and this was before the the fence went around the the field, and so gate receipts were past the hat. They would just pass it around the crowd because there wasn't a gate where you could collect receipts. Uh, it became Brooksfield in 1922, and about that time it got the fence. And at least at least it looks better. Um, but um, fun fact: uh, the original field, which was established in 1893, was described in a bunch of different ways. I picked two good quotes that I like. One was several acres of rocky ground surrounded entirely by wind. The second quote was after a nice windstorm, they have to get out the surveying crew in order to find the home plate. Then they have to sink a shaft to get to it. So it was it was notorious in the conference for for not being the most well groomed field we had. So trivia: What star athlete has a building named for him? Hey, I'm watching the chat. Hmm. Okay, well, I can think of another one, but I think that uh, Savannah's got it with Marv K, because that's certainly true. Yes. Uh, but Steve, you are also correct with Russell Volk, with Volk Jim. But um, to be fair, I get we we will call Savannah the winner, and uh, of course Marv K Field is what we're referring to. So, congrats, Savannah! You've got goodies coming your way. And 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 bad to me for not phrasing that differently. So, but so what I had been thinking of originally was Russell Rutt Volk, class of 1926. Um, he's not very well known today, and I'm not sure people really know why he has a building named after him. But he played. He was an all. He was an all around athlete. He played varsity football, baseball, basketball, and uh, I think wrestling and boxing were not varsity at the time. And and pretty much any sport Mines Campus offered. Um, he had four years here. He earned fifteen varsity letters and four conference championships. Um, and he was, for, for years, he was known as the premier athlete that Mines had ever seen. He actually went out and got a petroleum engineering degree from here and, and uh, uh, was had a very successful career. But he, it, it, people would talk about how he was everywhere. He was in every sport um, and got out of Mines with a degree. So um, yeah, good for him. But yes, you're right. Marv K uh, would be the one to actually come to mind. I'm, I'm stuck in history at this point, so... Good for you. So, um, okay. I love your comment, Steve. <laughs> Can everybody see that? <laughs> oh, Volk. We love Volk. Okay. Yeah. So 1920s, uh, again, uh, much more active, but really a much better development of the campus culture and, and how the campus was working. The 1920s was when the Ore Digger newspaper first came out, Voice of World's Foremost Mining School. It's when the petroleum engineering department was formed. It was when the geophysics department was formed, the geophysical engineering department, sorry. And, and those two were departments that were, if not unique, uh, were, were uh, amongst a very small group of universities that had departments in either of these fields. So, so th this was a big thing for the campus to, to have these departments. Um, first homecoming in the 20s. Blue Key formed in the 20s from the Vigilantes, which were an informal group of um, uh, upperclassmen who had made it, took it upon themselves to help uh, support the traditions of mines and, and to encourage other people, other, other people at the school to do so, um, as well as some pretty uh, uh, involved guarding of the M. Uh, which we won't get into for this one. Um, Engineers Day was for, was first started in 1920s, and it was started as a career fair. Uh, the, it was mostly a, a, an opportunity for faculty to show off their research and for students to connect with the invited engineers from all over the region, um, a, a bunch of different states to come in, and this gave the students the opportunity to to talk with these people, network with them, and and potentially pick up jobs. And uh, finally, the Colorado School of Mines Foundation was 
was uh, established in the 1920s. Yeah. Fun fact, by 1929, the average annual faculty salary is almost $3,000. So just <laughs> something to think about. And trivia. This oh. is kind of a slight trick question, I think. What animal became mine's first mascot with a bonus round for what was this mascot's name? Ready? Da, 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 da. Guesses? Guesses? Rod is guessing Burrow. Stephanie is guessing Blaster the Burrow. Dan, okay. I don't believe that's correct. <laughs> are we ready? Sure. So are we, are, no, no, any other guesses before we move on? Okay. No winner for this question, but Lisa, okay. take it away. That's okay. It, it is kind of a trick question because our first mascot was a small goat and uh, it was named Zeolite. Yeah, school of mines, minerals, and <laughs> and and goats were popular mascots uh, in the twenties because they, if you if you played it right, they were small, they were inexpensive, they ate almost anything, and nobody had valued a goat very much. So so mascots, you know, goats as mascots worked out. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, and so. Uh, we actually had a, uh, we actually stole Boulder's mascot uh, before this and took you know, and and drag, drag it around to parades and games and stuff. Um, so Boulder had a goat mascot before we did, but we finally got our own goat mascot uh, without theft. Um, so uh, that's it. Um, so right. campus before and after World War II. Um, this again, I'll jump around quite a bit. 1930s and 40s, Bertha Hall was was, uh, was uh, constructed in 1938. This picture isn't ours, but you can see people on top of the roof. Um, it was uh, uh, dedicated in 1940, but the east and west rings, which aren't aren't on here now, were put on in 1939. The building wasn't even done yet when they then they added wings on either side. Um, the more fun part, though, is the Army Specialized Training Program was uh, brought to campus in 1943, where the Army, the military uh, contracted with campus to provide uh, an accelerated curriculum for um, uh, cadres of of army men that came in. I mean, hundreds at a over a hundred at a time. And I think we had had three at least three successive waves of these guys. Um, an accelerated curriculum for this school meant that everybody took the accelerated curriculum, and uh, which which was interesting. Um, but at that point, there were more military students on campus that by far than there were uh, traditional students, okay? So if you think about that though, um, Mines campus in the 30s and 40s, they had an, a, a, a student club, that's it. They had no cafeterias, no lunch, no, no you know, mess hall, no nothing. They had no housing. So you've got like 150 people coming on campus. And and so uh, one of the things they did was politely or not so politely, I don't know, tell the fraternity members that they had to vacate their homes and go find housing somewhere else in Denver or Golden. And the fraternity houses were, were renovated. Uh, uh, bunk beds were crammed into every available space. They redid the... Uh, 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 plumbing to handle that amount of men. And so all the fraternity houses had had military men in them. Um, and as far as feeding them, and 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 plus, and there was, if I remember right, one of the athletic buildings, they also crammed that full of bunk beds as well. Um, as far as food, I put Bertha Hall on there because Bertha Hall, brand new Bertha Hall, uh, the basement became a mess hall. They tore out whatever they had put in it and built a mess hall for all these 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 men. Um, and, uh, it was, a, it was a very interesting experience. This was for the, the, you know, the potential war effort. 
Um, and the army knew they weren't going to get engineers, but they wanted men with as much training, technical training as they could cram into them in, I think it was like, um, I want to say it was like, it's, it's, it, it was a little more than a year, but I don't think much more. So, but it wasn't very, a large amount of time, um, but that was most of what was on campus. Okay. Fun fact, couldn't resist. Sticky the dog earns his mascot of minds degree with the class in 1934. He actually got a degree. Um, and, and this was not a trivia question because not a lot of people know this one. Um, he was apparently diligent about attending class. He would go into classrooms and sack out um, at someone's feet and, and stay there. Uh, wasn't disruptive. Uh, he got his degree. Um, he graduated at the same time with the man who had adopted him or brought him on. I, it's, it's unclear which, who then took him with him and he graduated. He went on to an illustrious career elsewhere. So I, I there was rumors that he got a silver diploma, but <laughs> I'm not convinced of that. So, uh, but there, there it, it came up somewhere in there. Okay, <laughs> trivia. When did we officially become the Colorado School of Mines? Our official title. Ready, go. I'm watching the chat. Thirty-two, thirty-eight. Lisa, help me here, because you know the answer, and I'm forgetting it. So you the know answer what... is. Wait, 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 wait. Has everybody? Oh, wants sorry. To... Yes. Well, they know now. Sorry. Oh, 19, 1937. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, shoot. Let's see. Uh, how do we do this to make it fair? Uh, you might just have to pick a name at random or the person who wins the next one gets this one or something. Maybe. I don't know. Sorry. I, I, I revealed it too soon. Well, Stephanie oh, Ellis has 38. So that's, I think that's, close. that's right there. Okay. okay. All right. That, that's good. Okay. This is way later than I thought it, it was <laughs> actually. Okay. So. Okay. Sorry about that. All right. Um, Post-war was another one of those really interesting times in the school's history. Um, the GI Bill uh, was out there. And so our student population exploded. We were offering people a lucrative career. We were offering men a lucrative career um, after their service in World War II. Um, the mines even actually advertised in the, the uh, army newspaper that was went out to different different army sites um, that, that, that they were interested in having students apply. Um, uh, upper right is a picture of a, a, a man, his wife, and their young, I hope that's a daughter, um, and uh, the guy was actually voted the typical minor. They they would always have every year they would have a typical minor contest for the seniors, and they would they would vote on the person that most personified the ideals of the mines man. And this that year it was a married man with a kid, first time ever. Um, so uh, this was a a major change for the school. Um, uh change in demographics for sure. Uh, uh, veterans were a, a significant part of the population, so non-traditional students, and they had families who lived on campus. Um, and, and so um, when I talk about living on campus, remember I said there's no, there's still no dorms and there's no cafeterias or the mess halls were ripped out. Okay, so so mines and, and a lot of the other things were ripped out, but, but mines, uh, uh, over as much time as they could as quickly set up uh, temporary living quarters. They, they scavenged army barracks and um, uh, uh, prefab buildings. They stuffed the field house with small uh, one room trailers. They put trailers down by Brooks Field, pretty much everywhere where they could put additional housing, they, they put that housing. Um, the leftmost photo uh, shows the guy studying at a table. Uh, this is the armory. The armory was crammed with bunk beds. And this was the single men's quarters. Uh, single men who couldn't get in there were mostly on their own because almost every other uh, housing 
arrangement was for married uh, with or married with children, uh, couples and families. So this this uh, picture alone has one, two, three, four, five, six visible bunk beds in just this one corner. Everywhere they could put a bunk bed, they put a bunk bed. Okay. Um, and having families on campus really helped change the culture. It, it changed the culture. Um, we had never had, other than a few scattered women who lived in town, not on campus, we had never had this many women on campus ever, ever. I mean, um, and this brought a lot of changes in traditions. Um, uh, as as one uh, veteran indicated in, in the ore digger at one point, he said, uh, you know, I'm here, my wife is here on campus with me. We are not doing that particular tradition. Uh, so they actually formed a group. They got together and, and a bunch of them said, we are not, we're just, we're just not this. We are, we were at war. We're not going to do some of this stuff. Um, some of the, so some of the cultural traditions changed uh, to a point because you've got, you know, the difference between an 18 year old and a 25 year old ex-military man who fought in France, you know, it's pretty significant. Um, so uh, fun fact, the campus swimming pool first opens to women and children. First time ever, uh, because of that, there was that there were that many women and children on campus, and it was for an afternoon, if I remember correctly. And men were absolutely not allowed anywhere near there at that time. Uh, the rest of the time, women and children were not allowed anywhere near the pool. It was men only. Um, the other thing is the rise of the Dames Club. Um, there was a women's faculty club uh, fairly early on. In, not women, sorry the Wives of Faculty Club uh, very early on in campus. Uh, but now you've got a bunch of uh, young military wives. And so they ballooned the Faculty Wives Club and they were separate for a little bit, but they all became one. And that was the founding of the Dames Club. Um, the Dames Club was actually responsible for much of the social life on campus that didn't involve drinking beer. Okay. Um, so they, they held blood, they held, um, fundraisers, they held teas, they held, um, socials where people could interact with, with each other in a non-alcoholic environment. Um, and, and so they drove a lot of the, the, the social life for the families in particular on this campus. Okay. Um, fifties and sixties and going pretty quick. Um, the campus obviously grows. This here's some pictures of the, the the renovated student center. They finally got a student center. Um, I want to say early '60s. Um, but but they they finally got a student center, and then it's been renovated more than once. This is the renovation in in about 1970 1971. New student center had a bowling alley, had all sorts of amenities that I hadn't didn't know it had at the time, and it had uh, what became the I Club, which was the Rascaler where where people could sit around and 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 socialize and drink beer. Okay. Um, beer, if I remember it was, uh, first, uh, it's like 50 cents a pitcher or something like that early on. Um, so fun fact, a time capsule was inserted into the new student union in 1964. Okay. That time capsule was actually discovered in what was it? 2015, somewhere around there. I don't remember. It was, it was, mm -hmm. it was a, a little while ago. Um, when they were doing some renovations and they they busted into it, found the time capsule by accident, uh, a new time capsule was put into the student union's exterior. And we're going to remember that one because we'd forgotten all about this one. So, um, and also a carillon was installed in Guggenheim's tower in 1966. Okay. This was a, an experiment. Um, and they, they, they said it was going to be a trial basis. A donor funded everything. And at first, it got a lot of complaints. People, uh, students complained about, I can't study. The carillon's going off. Okay. Students complained, I can't. It's waking me up. I can't get to sleep. The carillon's going off. Well, carillon didn't ever really run at night, so I'm not sure what was going on there. But but they complained about it was, it was breaking into their sleep. Um, but it persisted, and over time, it we got a lot more fans, and so we still have a carillon today. Um, uh, yeah, it it, it I, I think it became one of the, the iconic things of mine's actually. Um, okay, trivia. When did Blaster become our mascot? Everybody, I'm watching the chat. Whoever is the closest will win. Guesses? 1955. Okay. 
Keep going. Any other guesses? D3. Keep going. Lisa, don't show the answer okay. yet. Yep. I'm I'm <laughs> okay. And you know the answer. I, I think I remember, but you know. So once we give folks more time. Okay. Any other guesses? 1930, 59, 51. Okay. Good range there. Anybody else want to take a guess? Like the price is right. Yeah, right. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> and the survey says, no, wrong game show. Okay. <laughs> All right. So Lisa, oh, we got a 57. Okay. Is that All right. Which is it? Do you see the correct answer in any of these guesses? With our first blaster, 1951. So somebody guessed 51. 51. 51, 51. Dalton Ellis. Nice. All right. Congrats, Dalton. Yep. Got some goodies coming to you. <laughs> yeah. They they had they had switched from goats to burrows years ago, obviously. Um, but uh, uh, reportedly, a faculty member first suggested that they call this this particular mascot Blaster, and the name stuck. Um, so that's that's how we got Blaster. Okay. Highlights of the seventies. I'm getting close to the end of what I uh, the, my timeline here. Um, Caldwell Women's Residence Hall was dedicated in 1970, so we had enough women to actually form a hall. And you, and they there was there were complaints that the the women who were living in town were were missing out on on campus life and and, and things like that. And and so they finally uh, took one of the residential buildings then in in our neighborhood and and turned it into the Women's Residence Hall. The Green Center was uh, finished, I think, in 1971. And that changed kind of the face of campus or the, where the quad is. Some of the buildings were torn down. Some of the residences were removed. And this is probably more like the face of campus today than it was before that. Um, we saw the rise of environmental sciences at Mines. This was a, a big time for environmental activism in the late 60s and mostly in the 70s, though. And um, I created quite a quite a. a, a spectrum of uh, uh, viewpoints on environmental sciences. Um, there were people who protested uh, teaching environmental sciences because it would interfere with um, mining engineering. And there were people who were, you know, we, we who were for it. And it was a big mix of students and faculty both. The other thing was the rise of women students. There are more women students on campus. Obviously we had enough for a residence hall. Um, in the late 60s, the school started offering Bachelor of Science degrees for the first time, uh, persistent ones anyway. And so this was more attractive to, this was in physics, chemistry, and math, made it more attractive for the women who were interested in going to mines to get that sort of degree. Um, and uh, what was happening throughout the 70s is that you more, much more frequently see women in uh, at student council, heading clubs, um, uh, working in organizations disproportionately um, because most of these women were, were actually um, engaged in helping to run the student side of the university. Uh, I guess not most of them, but, but a disproportionate number. They, they were very active and very visible as campus leaders. Um, so U.S. Bicentennial 1976, we celebrated that. Uh, there's the Prospector 1976 in color there. Uh, upper right, um, Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, that's, I'll, I'll, say, I'll wait on that. Um, we've got a student at a, a, a computer terminal um, because again, uh, computing had come to minds, um, followed almost immediately by not enough computing had come to minds and uh, an E-Days uh, sign. And then again, push ball, which was still going strong. Okay, fun fact. Question about push ball really fast. I know a lot of uh, alums on this call probably remember the push ball. I, I know I've spoken to some of you about it. Was it done away with? Because at some point it just, you know, it maybe students got uh, flattened by it, <laughs> would land on them and hurt people. And uh, it was a kind of a, a risky thing to do, hazardous thing to do. You alums on the call, agree, disagree, unmute, speak. I just, we don't do it anymore, but, and I'm not sure what the reason why, but I think that's why. Anybody? I was told that uh, 
that um, from Mr. Bill Zish that uh, a an innocent bystander observing and actually not paying attention to the activity uh, was taken out by the ball and uh, you know so yeah. that kind of ended the fun and games. <laughs> <laughs> oh, in a wheelchair knocked him over. Oh boy, yeah, that's a little risky, isn't it? Well, fun pictures. Yeah, the uh, my from what I can what I can what I would conjecture is that pushball kind of took the place of some of the more uh, 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 rigorous uh, games and traditions um, that had been banned over time, um, and so pushball seemed seemed more common. But if you look at some pushball pictures, you can see people aren't really smiling and, and this isn't like fun. This is to win the game. And, and, uh, and it was often class against class, uh, with pushball. So, um, okay. Uh, just the anniversaries, uh, the 1949 was our 75th anniversary. Um, and there was a big headline that said women in a man's world, because we had three of them. Um, and uh, there's a picture of the three. Um, the middle one is Jackie Borthick, and she actually graduated from the school. I think she was the one who got the petroleum engineering degree, maybe. Um, uh, but uh, uh, that was a, that was the yeah. And again, this was the time when there were a lot of uh, student wives and and families on campus still. Um, mine's a hundredth anniversary in 1974. It was a big blowout. Um, they 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 put out all sorts of invitations and they have scrapbooks and, and, and it was in, and they built a town in the uh, quad. And I'll talk about that in a minute. And mine's at 150, of course, is 150 anniversary. That's what we're doing now. Um, and so let me just, uh, so fun fact, the, the mine's hundredth anniversary, the, uh, one of the attendees was an Apollo 17 astronaut who uh, was accompanied by a moon rock and a large scale model of the lunar uh, lander module. Um, and this is Mineral City, the, the pictures here, um, I'm gonna, let's see, oops, get rid of that a minute. Mineral City was built on the quad and it's basically an entire town. It had uh, saloons, at least, at least one saloon. I'm guessing there were probably more. It had a laundry, a livery stable, it had a jail. It had an asset office. I seem to remember that it had a head frame that's, that someone had built there. Um, and so this is built in front of, uh, on across the street from uh, Guggenheim Hall. Um, the fall semester, they had a lot of celebrations. Um, you had to, you had appropriate attire you were required to wear. If not, you would end up in jail. I believe they jailed the governor of Colorado at one point. Um, they, they, they put on a, uh, pageants and things like this is a shootout um uh at the at the at mineral city um and they also found time to actually adulterate a little bit a guggenheim tower with their favorite beverage so that everyone could everyone could see what it was about but uh, mineral city was actually i thought it would stay up longer but i think it was already being at least partially down, torn down by spring semester um it it uh, didn't last very long but it was a very involved effort and and it it really personified what they thought of as mine's 100th anniversary, uh, and 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 it was almost entirely student constructed, in my understanding. So, and if somebody somebody knows different, you know, please let me know or or private message me. Um, okay, so uh, that is the bulk of my talk. Um, I just a few resources. The Mines History Archive has a web page. The Mines Repository has, has a digital archives uh, section for the CSM history. And again, the Ordigger newspaper is one of Colorado Historic Newspapers collections titles. Uh, these are all openly accessible and you're more than welcome to go look through them, download things that you're interested in, do whatever you'd like with them. And last trivia, what's the oldest building on campus now? Doo -doo. I'm watching the chat. Up. Oh. Dalton Ellis wins again. <laughs> All got it. Uh, Engineering Hall. Yes, Lisa? Yes, it is. Just checking to make sure people are paying attention. Very um, good. So I, I want to thank you guys for having me. And if you have any uh, questions, you can email me directly. We've got oh, like a minute. Sorry. Um, but uh, I'm happy to answer any questions um, about anything on the school's history that I can that I can answer.
Thank you so much. Um, there is just so much to learn about this place. And for those of us who have been around a while, um, boy, new new fun facts around every turn. And certainly this year coming to the forefront as we celebrate 150 years. So thank you so much, Lisa, for putting this together. Um, as we do at the end of each program, I wanna make sure you all know about next month's program, uh, which again, third Thursday of the month, It'll be on the 21st of March, and our program is going to feature uh, Walt Copan, who is the Vice President of Research and Technology Transfer here at Mines. So you'll learn a little bit about the evolution of research here and where we're headed. It should be really interesting. So join us for that. You can register at the same place that you registered for this program. We are continuing to add to the spring program uh, lineup, so uh, take a look and visit that page often. Congratulations again to Stu, Steve, Kip, Savannah, Dalton, and Stephanie. I've got goodies coming your way soon. Uh, and thanks for playing the little trivia with us. We could go for many more hours and there's so much more to share. Um, but before we officially wrap, does anybody have any quick story or memory for the good of the order before we sign off? I'd like to share. As you said, so many, many more. <laughs> I know it. Hard to know where to start and where to stop. Uh, gosh, anybody want to chime in? There was a little bit about the push ball, having been an observer and participant. <laughs> that, 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 that baby was not a docile activity. Um, when that, that ball hit, the the momentum and the, I guess because of the diameter of the ball and the whole nine yards, it would it would knock you 10, 15 yards if it hit you. Oh, and uh, it was it was high impact. I see some heads shaking yes in there. Uh, so I don't know that saying it replaced some of the calmer things. I mean, yes, it did replace the gauntlet, you know, and I, I see some heads shaking. Some other people had to do the gauntlet, which was in our case, the seniors pounding you with belts as you ran through Stratton Commons, but it was known at the time. Um, and it, it was a very, it, there was a, a lot of hazing, a lot of physical, um, oh, I guess, testing of early underclassmen, freshmen. We ran to class. I think other people had to do that. Wore our clothes backwards, had to carry our books on our head. Uh, I've never been in such good shape in my life as I was after <laughs> six weeks of freshman year. Um, I don't know. I don't want to go on. I think other people can can enter into this because we all had to go through it. Um, yeah. Yeah. So people may not know about Mark Kay. His dad actually was an All-American football player also. His name was Marv Katzenstein. And um, with World War II, um, he was in my dad's class, actually, in 41, 42. And so he, they changed it to K for because of the uh, just the last name, some things going on at the time. And uh, so we all knew him as Marv K, but his dad was also an All American. Uh, I know we were uh, talking at the beginning of this program. Um, there's a new book out about Marv and his life. Um, it was just published earlier in February. Uh, you can purchase it on Amazon. So for all of you Marv K aficionados and who's not, uh, you can purchase that uh, on Amazon. So, Lisa, uh, I got a quick question. Uh, and th this may be something that uh, I've been asked. Uh, there was a humor magazine in during the 60s called The Picker. And uh, do, you <laughs> maintain, do you maintain that uh, any any past issues of that in your archives you know i i'm aware of it um but we don't have any issues none survived i i have a few scattered issues of the senior day newspaper but i the picker i so if anybody has um a run or some some issues um we could that we could scan or something if well i don't know though because it the as you may have remembered the the it wasn't for for like polite company sometimes 
<laughs> That's but a nice way to say it. The only thing I would say about that, you're you're absolutely correct, but it was it was very tame compared to some of the issues other campuses have put out at that time and since that time. It, you know, it's just a. Uh, the Campus Humor, Humor Magazine was uh, distributed, if I remember right, for free. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that's all I wanted to say. I, I look back on the humor in there and some of it, I mean, if you look at it, I, I wouldn't want my grandkids to see it. But at that time, that was really, really radical. <laughs> yeah, they, they um, ran I'll... some of those jokes in the in the Ordigger newspaper. It, it was, it was, yeah, it was risque, but not. It didn't come close to the senior newspaper. Let's put it that way. Put so. it close to what? <laughs> the senior, the senior day newspaper. Oh yeah, no, you're right about that. Yeah, Dan, I do know a few alums uh, who have copies, um, and I've seen them. Uh, the ones that I've seen are printed on pink newsprint, and uh, you know, kind of stand out a little bit. And there's a lot of interesting content in there. Um, so if you ever want to chat offline, I can uh, maybe put you in touch or Lisa in touch with that alum and we could get some okay. scans they're they're priceless they are so oh. funny <laughs> irreverently it's, it's, funny yeah it's a part yeah. of this this it's part of the story of students of at course. minds at that time so yeah well everybody we're over time by just five minutes but um boy i i just would love to hear more from everybody um can't do it today at this program but i encourage you to to reach out to lisa via email or to me and we can share more of these stories as our history displays on campus come together. You know, we've got uh, more ways to um, to share your stories. And uh, you are minds. You are what has made minds. And uh, we're excited to celebrate it all this year. It's a big deal. It's a big year. So many, many thanks. I hope to see many of you, if not all of you, next month for Lunch Bunch, March 21st, again, uh, with Walt Copan. And our topic will be uh, the evolution of research here at Mines. Thank you all and go Ordiggers. <laughs>